welcome. This is Terry Roberts with DMAI uh, with an empowering webinar. And our topic today is meetings inclusion and your responsibility to provide the right access to attendees with all abilities. And I'm just thrilled to be here today. I know we have a very engaged audience. Um, because I have been receiving many um, notes this morning about people who unfortunately couldn't make it and they're so excited about the opportunity to just get the recording because they feel this information is so important. So for your um, information today, uh, we will be sending a recording and we encourage your questions. We hope that you will type in your questions. Um, during the course of the webinar so that we can ask our esteemed panelists to answer. And in that regard, I'd like to introduce you first to Andy Fernandez with the City of Eugene. And Andy has just such an amazing background with adaptive services and including, inclusion services. And prior to arriving in Oregon in his current position, he spent almost five years as the inclusion supervisor for the city of Reno and has been responsible for multiple um, programs as the accessibility as the accessibility chair, uh, including the 2004 National Recreation and Parks Association annual conference, and he considers himself an advocate for the inclusion of people of all disabilities. And I know you're going to learn a lot um, from Andy today because I've learned a lot from him and. Janice as well as we've prepared for this webinar. And I love in Andy's bio that he says that he serves on a variety of um, professional leadership roles and on a number of local, state, and national boards. And he continues to say yes before thinking. And um, Andy, we're glad that you said yes to us today before thinking. So welcome, Andy. Thank you. And then we have also joining Andy today um, our friend Janice Ross. She is the Vice President of Convention and Sports Marketing with the Travel uh, Lane County, which is Eugene and Cascades Coast, CBB in Oregon. And Janice there um, just does wonderful work with her team and really has um, a great place in her heart and her education um, in terms of this topic. So we are really excited to have her provide the CBB perspective. She also has 10 years of experience as a corporate meeting planner and marketing communications manager. So she brings a real well-rounded um, background of knowledge to this topic as well. So Janice, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Terry. So our webinar at a glance today, um, we're going to spend time with both Andy and Janice talking to us about um, accessibility considerations as you begin to plan your meeting, really preparing you what we hope will be um, with the right questions to ask, and then um, arm you with some resources and suggestions for building a really good plan of action. So I'm going to ask Andy to um, tee it off to really begin to talk about considerations as you start to think about um, taking responsibility for making your meeting more accessible. Yes, thank you very much. So I um, want to start with a little bit of background, and this is pretty common knowledge. Depending on the numbers and, and who you ask, you're looking at about uh, 56 million people in this country, or, or roughly about 18% of people in the last census disclosed that they had some sort of disability, some sort of disabling condition. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting benefits for that or, or a doctor has written um, a, a diagnosis, but those folks identify as having some sort of disability. And that's actually a pretty significant number. And it's, um, it's no secret that uh, we have an aging baby boomer population. And um, whether they disclose disability or, or think they have a disability or not, um, disability is part of the aging process, and so when we're we're talking about accessibility, I want to be clear that it's not just qualified individuals with disabilities, as the Americans with Disability Act, Act might say, but it's also um, basically a benefit to all of our patrons, all the people who might be attending, and and you'll see this theme pop up a little bit as we continue to talk through this uh, presentation. How um, there are these collateral benefits. Um, even for you and I when we when we attend these events. So I just wanted to emphasize that. 
So, you know, the ADA has really drilled into us um, the physical access. These are the things that we see the most um, when we go to a, a restaurant or a hotel or whatever. And if, you know, the ramps and the elevators and the, even the accessible rooms and the, the bars and the showers and things like that. Um, and those things are very, very important. Those are the, the barriers that, that most people frequently or first encounter. Um, but they're not the only barriers that we're looking at when we're, we're talking about accessibility. And we're also looking at access to um, the materials, access to the presentations, access to the events. And sometimes those things are not so physical in nature. And so um, I've had to retrain my brain as I've learned more about accessibility to think it's not just about those physical barriers. Disability isn't just the person in the wheelchair. It's actually a broad spectrum of ability that uh, we encounter in most of the things that we're doing. Um, so the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, and, and we're still you know, working on what that means. Um, it uh, um, had some great guidelines about um, removing barriers, and that's, that's you're sort of looking at, at a checklist here, and, and that was the, one of the very first guidelines that came out here was ba basically barrier removal. Um, so when you're considering your destinations, you want to build in um, thinking about accessibility from the get-go, and you can't start too soon. I think if, there, if you get nothing else from this presentation, start thinking about who am I going to ask, how I'm going to ask about this question as I start investigating, um, planning a meeting or planning a destination or planning an event. So um, it, it's also uh, need to note and stress that it is our responsibility as meeting planners and event organizers to ask these questions. So the, the ADA, without going into a long background, is, is broken into these different uh, categories, Title I, Title II, Title III. Title I is employment. We're not going to talk about that. Title II is public accommodations. And these are the things that we see where I work in a city or a municipality. Title III are, are um, uh, sorry, government accommodations. Title III is sort of these public accommodations. <laughs> that's my phone. That's so funny because I don't know where it is. Um, public accommodations are are um, things or events that the public would um, have access to uh, as as a general person in the community. So it's not a government access. This is a different standard, and it is our responsibility as meeting planners to make sure that those things are accessible. One thing I, I need to stress, though, is that we shouldn't assume just because the ADA has been around for as long as it has that everything is perfect. And so, again, asking early, asking soon about accessibility, about the plans, about the designs, about the features um, will actually uh, help you with a lot of headaches as you go through. Um, and we're talking not just about the, uh, the place or the convention center or the exhibit halls, but we're also talking about uh, the hotels the restaurants, um, any of the experience that your attendees will be having in, in the meeting, you, you want to have as much foresight about sort of what the access is as possible so that you can actually share that with your attendees and, and, and help them navigate uh, what the issues might be. Um, Andy, I will. The last um, thing I I just want to, I don't want to interrupt you, but I did want to let uh, everyone know that we will be providing um, a link to the ADA checklist and, and the specific yes. requirements of Title III. So uh, it, as you said, it is a, really has a lot of detail. So we'll, we'll make sure that everyone has access Perfect. to that Perfect. Yes, because that, that is a wonderful uh, checklist. It helps calibrate your brain and get you thinking about all the different things from the minute I park to when I get into the event all the different barriers that, that you could be looking at. The last thing I want to say, just before we go to the next slide, is that um, the ADA is designed so that if you are making an effort, a lot of people ask me, well, if I uncover these things, if I uncover problems, doesn't that make me vulnerable to, to a lawsuit? Am I now responsible? Actually, the ADA is designed that if you make a good faith effort to, to navigate those problems and, and identify them and help solve them, you're actually in a better spot than sticking your head in the sand and, and saying, well, if I don't know about the problem, then it doesn't exist. So I, I want to say, again, asking the question helps you in a lot of different facets. And I'm sure that Janice will hop in here and say, who is going to ask and who is 
I'm going to ask who's going to answer those questions. Exactly, exactly. Well, I think that's where your, your CVB really comes into play because we know our destination so well. And, and as a meeting planner uh, looking to hold your conference in, an, in a new destination that you may not be familiar with, there are lots of local resources and, and uh, thing, issues to navigate and questions to ask that, that you know, just seem overwhelming, I know, sometimes. And that's where I think the whole accessibility issue gets gets meeting planners in a, in a quandary. So, um, and obviously the accessibility issue, as Andy mentioned, doesn't, isn't confined to the hotel or the conference space. So really considering the overall accessibility of the destination at large. And your CVB can answer questions like that. So uh, you know, from the moment they set foot in the airport or drive in, in, their, in their vehicle, um, their entire experience, every touch point really needs to be seen through that filter of accessibility and making sure everyone has that positive, great experience. Great. So let's begin then your conversation. And I'd like to ask um, Andy and Janice to sort of share with our audience some overarching suggestions for beginning to take those right steps with that lens to assure that people are able to take advantage of what their meeting has to offer regardless of any limitations. And I know that um, it's all about questions, so we'll start, um, Andy, with the survey. Yeah, so the, the most important piece when we're talking about people and we're talking about a meeting of people in any type of venue is to ask folks what they need. Um, that is the, the, the basic tenant, the basic principle of um, getting to understand how to meet their needs and then provide the, that accessibility and those accommodations. So, you know, make sure that you have in your registration materials, and not just for, for the attendees, but for other folks, um, a way for them to disclose what their accessibility needs are. Um, you're, you're already seeing this with uh, food allergies. You're seeing this um, when you travel with airlines and, and other, it's actually a best practice but put it in your registration uh, materials and make it obvious. Put it in a place where um, people can actually see, oh yeah, here's, here's my opportunity to tell folks, hopefully in advance, that I need X, Y, or Z. And this will go a long way to um, helping you make those accommodations um, in the broad, spe uh, broad spectrum as far as um, for the whole event or for that individual who you want to provide good customer service to. And when you put together your RFP or your venue and hotel specification sheets, be sure to include accessibility questions and, and, requ and require a clause actually in your contract that indicates that the facility does meet ADA requirements. Um, you know, one an interesting example too, in terms of, of vetting that there are, your, and your CVB can help you with this, there are, um, local resources that can help you um, determine whether a, a venue really is in compliance. Um, I had an interesting situation where um, a group needed uh, elevators for their, for their, a uh, lot of their participants coming in. They were, there was an elderly military reunion group and, and that was a requirement in their RFP and, and one of the hotels that responded, it, this was in another destination, but one of the hotels that responded said, yes, we have an elevator. But when the planner went to do the site tour, the hotel did indeed have an elevator, but it was a service elevator where the guests would have to go through the kitchen. And, you know, so technically, yes, but, you know, those are kind of some things to keep in mind is, is you know, the, the hotel said technically, yes, we do offer an elevator that a guest can use, but, you know, is, is that the guest experience that you want your participants to have? So, so really keying in with the hotels and indicating how important that is, is really important. Yeah, and, and, and don't forget to ask about any planned reno renovations and construction during your event. Um, I've had numerous times where, oh my gosh, you have the, the most wonderful uh, intention with accessibility in a hotel, um, but for some reason that there's a construction going on. And uh, in, in my profession, we're, we're sort of an off-season uh, conference goer because we're not really um, deep pockets. So, so we tend to get the, the time where there is a lot of construction and something's going on. And yeah, the hotel was totally accessible, but the sidewalks leading to the hotel were all barricaded off. Or um, the, uh, you know, the, they were working on the rooms or the floor that had the accessible room. So just, you know, good question to ask when you're, when you're setting it up. 
I think that's really key, Andy, because you know sometimes when temporary barricades or detours are set up to allow for renovations and construction, I think that that the, the ADA um, had, it, it's just sort of forgotten about for a moment because they're just trying to make it fit. So that's a great tip, I think. And um, transportation, of course, um, you you know we we almost always see transportation needs in conferences, whether it's going to a special event or an offsite. Um, session, so be sure to ask transportation companies to provide documentation of compliance as well. Yeah, and um, definitely make sure that you're looking at um, your space considerations uh, to accommodate those with special mobility needs, uh, especially. Um, and I'll even say, um, I've, I've been to a several different programs where um, you'll have a very accessible hotel, and, and they'll be given an award, and everybody will be going up on stage, and then all of a sudden you're realizing um, that the tables are set in a way where the person can't get to the stage, or, or worse, the stage wasn't accessible. And so that person actually had to receive their award down on the floor, whereas everybody else was on stage getting their pictures taken. And so little tweaks there are, are definitely uh, helpful in, in sort of thinking it through. Again, knowing who is attending your event and what their needs are help you foreshadow uh, those issues. And depending on that survey of special needs that you did, you need to consider the type of perhaps assisted audio devices or interpreters that you might need to support access to your program content. And you might need to even consider altering some visual components of your meeting for, for your attendees who might be sight impaired. Um, large fonts or braille materials or, or some other altered format that they may need. So it's important, you know, don't forget about the program content accessibility as well. And, and Janice, the, the beautiful part about that is that because of digital technology now, a lot of that is a lot easier than it was, say, even four or five years ago. So to print okay. something in large print um, is very simple now, whereas, or, or Braille is not even actually requested as much as alternative formats. Something in a digital format can even be um, read over a screen reader. So you might have someone say, I don't need the large print. I just need that document onto my computer or my tablet so that it can voice over to me. And that's easy to do if you know in advance. So great suggestion. Yep. Perfect suggestion. So now that's kind of an overarching or a large glance at considerations, but I know that you both have some very specific areas um, drilling down to a little bit more detail that you thought were important to share with our audience. Yeah, so um, down to more detail. So speakers, presenters, and special guests. This is one that we tend to overlook, uh, especially if you're you're comping your your presenters or your speakers, or you know they don't have to go through the registration process, so they might miss the opportunity to disclose what kind of needs they have. Um, I've been on both ends of this, where I've been the organizer or the attendee with a colleague of mine with a disability, and and we have forgotten either you know how we're going to get that person from the hotel to the venue, or um, if the stage was accessible or if there were uh, interpreters or whatever. So make sure you're asking um, for those particular situations. The other story I'd like to share about this is the special guest piece um, really resonates and re has resonated with us in the past. We had an event here where we went to great lengths um, to make it accessible. It was our Olympic trials in 2008. And we were talking about well, the what ifs, you know, who might attend. And it ended up that um, one of our state uh, dignitaries ended up coming up to our event, and uh, he used a scooter because of a disability. And um, we were very happy that we made the VIP and the back areas of our event accessible when we were doing the planning because he was one of those people. He wasn't just someone in uh, you know, the stadium or, or the front end of the event. And so it was one of those, wow, good planning, save the day, got this guy where he needed to go um, was very helpful. Um, the other really big important piece of this is you can do this by committee. Um, it works sometimes, it sometimes doesn't. It's really nice to have someone who is accountable and responsible for um, uh, getting this done. And they don't have to be an accessibility expert. Um, they might end up being one of you listening and, and who um, basically has the, the foresight or the wherewithal to know who to call, know who to reach out to to help um, uh, make an event accessible. And so 
having someone responsible um, to provide oversight or accountability is really helpful in, in most events. Um, it's not a, an ADA requirement, but it is definitely a best practice. Um, training staff and volunteers. Uh, this sometimes is uh, daunting, especially if you have a lot of volunteers. Again, in, in, in 2008 and 2012, we did events here with you know two, three thousand volunteers, and giving them specific disability uh, and ADA accessibility training was going to be uh, problematic to the depth that we really wanted to. And so we ended up looking at a structure of of making sure that. Um, the volunteers knew where to go and where to ask if they got the question and had the basic tenets of what we were trying to do, basically the underlying mission and philosophy. But their captains or their supervisors were the ones who were trained in more depth. And then as you went up the chain, the, the depth got deeper and deeper of, of what to do. So we might have had a volunteer say, wow, I think we're having an issue over at this site. You know, the, uh, People can't get up onto the sidewalk. And they knew who to call, and that person knew who to call to the point we got someone who was responsible enough to say, oh yeah, we're going to make that right. We're going to you know, move the entry point or build a ramp or do what we need to do to make it accessible. So training staff and volunteers, at least on your, on your um, uh, concept, is really important. Janice? Yeah, I was just going to add, Andy, that you know when you do when you are proactive and do that ahead of time, you know, like like Andy was saying, they don't have to have all the answers. They just need to know where to go to get the answers and do it in a friendly, you know, seamless way. That makes all of your attendees feel very comfortable. Or instead of feeling like, oh, I'm going to be a burden, I've thrown them for a loop. Um, that that your your volunteers and your staff are prepared and it's handled professionally and seamlessly so that everyone's comfort level and, 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 and is, is there and they have a positive experience. Absolutely. Thanks. The other one is, uh, this Janice and I's favorite, is consider the length of transitions and travel time. Um, it's no secret that you know we're trying to get as much into our events as possible and, and sometimes we overlook the fact that some folks need a little more time to get to point A and point B. And here's one of those collateral benefits. When we do that, I think we allow everybody more time to get from point A to point B. Um, I've been to several conferences, and it seems like there's always just not enough time to go speak to the speaker and then move to where I need to go. Um, but if you have a mobility impairment, you need every moment that you, you can in order to navigate. You might have to go to the elevator, which is a little farther away. You might have to find a certain seat in the room um, or even uh, check in with someone to make sure that you're you're getting to the event or your needs are being met. So you know, think about that when you're looking at your population. Um, signage is really important in a lot of different ways. Uh, I know uh, a lot of convention centers and, and meeting areas are, are signed relatively well, but they're generic. And the ADA requires generic signage, but it doesn't require um, program-specific signage. And so when you're doing an event and your registration table or your place or your your route or what you're using might be a slightly different than the normal configuration or enhanced, you want to make sure that that's pretty well signed. And it doesn't have to be long summations. It could be as simple as having the universal symbol of disability. That's the, the blue guy in the wheelchair. Um, and, and directional signage that says, just go this way if you're looking for access, or, or this way if you need to talk to somebody. Um, it's really important. Um, the more groups I talk to, the more um, specific signage that, that they request at some point, and it might be at the registration table or when you're coming in. It's, you know, does this place have assisted listening? Does it have? Um, are there other uh, amenities that I can access in the in the facility? Um, are they here, and and where do I get them? So signage is really important. Most people with disabilities, it's not their first day having a disability, so they know to look for this and. Um, and if you can use the signage that they're familiar with and the symbols they're familiar with, you'll save yourself a, a ton of headache. And um, the last piece is, is post uh, your best practices and improvements. Um, you know, we're all learning from each other and um, uh, uh, can share information. Um, the only way we're going to learn from our mistakes is if we if we look for uh, the issues that that are coming on and we share how we resolve them. It's one of the reasons we're doing the, the webinar here. I can't tell you that I haven't made my mistakes in my day, um, but those things need to be shared and and um, posted not within not just with your colleagues but also with um, 
uh, other folks as well, and um, getting the feedback from the people you've asked for accessibility, how that went is also really important. Thank you, Andy. Janice, I would like for you, we're running a little bit long on time, but I'd like for you to Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I think it's, it's such great information. And Andy, I just really appreciate all the specific examples, because I think that's what really makes it come alive. But Janice, talking about um, specifically how CVBs can help, um, maybe you could summarize some of the most obvious things that CVBs could help planners with, with regard to to accessibility concerns. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, I won't read through the whole list, but I think for me the key points in terms of assistance you can get from your CVB, of course, is, is the information and access to local agencies and resources. That may be local government agencies, it could be independent living agencies or social services, but you know, we know our local community and local resources, so can, can you know, tie you into those great um, resources that you might need. And, and honestly, um, all of our local agencies and resources, they are so happy when people ask the question and they are so willing to help that um, it's really a joy to connect planners with our local resources. Um, asking the hotels and the venues about accessibility, I can't stress that enough. You know, um, I see this a lot on the sustainability side for meetings. We have to start asking the question. And, and as Andy mentioned, it's a good thing to ask the question. You, know, you don't, you don't want to you know, not ask the question for fear that, that, a, that a little knowledge might get you into trouble. So um, asking if they have accessibility plans, asking about um, if they have um, e examples of, of other groups they've worked with, um, creative examples of how they have accommodated different accessibility requests. I think that's a, a great way for you to find out how the hotel or venue really thinks about accessibility and how they can make it work for you. Transportation companies, uh, we just had a request recently for one single delegate staying at a conference hotel, coming in for a conference, that needed an uh, accessible transportation just for him to get from the hotel venue to an off-site and we were able to connect him with three different sources that, that would all have worked beautifully for him. So that's what the CVBs are here for, to answer those questions about the whole experience, accessible restaurants, attractions, um, and finding, really connecting you with the resources that you need. Andy, I'd like for you to close with this question that we all, you said, kind of always comes up, but is sort of the elephant in the living room, which is, what is this going to cost me to make all these adaptations and consider all these concerns? Yeah, you know, the, the answer, is this going to cost me more, is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, you know, I think the, the data out there is when you look at the majority of accommodations people provide for disability, um, most of them are actually pretty affordable. And, and knowledge is power, so actually providing the knowledge and allowing your conference attendees um, foresight in how they're going to navigate and attend your event is really the most important piece, and that, that doesn't really even cost you anything as long as you're forthright. Um, but the other piece here is, is that um, you know, th it, there is a cost sometimes to uh, making things accessible, but in the long run, um, balancing that cost out against um, sort of legal and other types of pressures ends up being relatively small. Um, you know, the other piece about that is is to to consider um, equity and, and looking at this from other people's eyes. And um, are there other things that we can do to make make these events more accessible um, on on the front end so that you can defer the cost. Uh, in the planning area, if you can defer the cost over a, either a long period of time or during the period of the event, it makes it a little bit easier. Great suggestions, on. all of them. And I hope that we've inspired you to look more closely um, through a different lens at the accessibility of your meeting. And I think um, part of our job at DMAI Empowerment specifically is to connect you with destination experts like Janice. And you can do that online at empowerment.com. And one of the things that often comes up with meeting planners is asking, you know, I heard Janice talk about what happens in Eugene, but what if I travel to a different destination? And uh, part of our um, effort at Empowerment is to show you what destinations provide what services um, 
understand whether they are always provided or dependent upon the size of your group or if there's a fee associated with them. And you can find that um, all under the Destination Profile Services tab. But clearly, um, I think that it's um, quite obvious that in each destination there are CVB sales professionals who want to help you um, find the right fit for your meeting and support your services there. Just a, a quick note about CMP credit, because I know everyone will be looking for that. You'll receive an email um, next week, and in that will be a recording of the webinar, the link to the ADA uh, specifics that we've talked about, and uh, a certificate for your 30 minutes of um, site management credit. So that will be headed your way um, during the business week next week. And I would like to thank everyone and um, thank our sponsor, ePro. We're going to take some questions from the audience. But before we do, I would like to ask uh, Chauncey Keller uh, with ePro to just speak for a moment, if she would, about how they can support you with meeting apps. Oh man, this is a great webinar. Just coming from um, someone who asked someone who's disabled in my family, um, this was really, really good information. So thank you guys so much for your thorough knowledge. That was awesome. Um, ePro Direct, we are a full digital hospitality marketing company and event app organizer. Um, I, I don't want to take a ton of time because I know we're really tight on it, but just so that you guys know that there is definitely um, an option out there for an app. Um, for your event, starting as low as $1,000, a custom do-it-yourself app, um, and then it can go on up for um, one event or one association that has an app and uses the same um, app for several different events. Um, on the hotel side, we're a full digital marketing agency that helps support uh, ePro Direct and ePro Meeting App. So um, we have recently developed a um, questionnaire of something if you are going to do an app, whether it's a hotel or a um, an association or a corporation for your event. Um, some questions to, to ask your app provider. Um, this will help you um, get kind of the basics covered and is able for you to compare um, vendor to vendor when it comes to um, event apps. So I will be sending that out to you if you have not received it before. Um, within the next week, uh, you'll be receiving that email from me. And just know if we can assist you in your apps for your meetings, we are here to help. Chauncey, thank you, and again, always for supporting us with our webinars. So Shimo, you've been monitoring the question board, and I know we have allowed time um, beyond the half hour for some questions, and so any burning ones that may be directed to either Andy or Janice. Thank you, Terry. We've had some really great questions come up, um, and thank you for the opportunity to present them. Um, you know, it seems like as planners, they're always they're always getting surprised, right? So I think it was really good best practice about um, surveying or requesting special needs. But um, what what do we do when they just sort of show up and um, they haven't identified themselves before? How do we really find ways to accommodate that, and is it our responsibility to do so? Well. Yeah, that's a great question, and and um, you know, good customer service dictates that yes, we want to accommodate our attendees and our patrons. So um, we want to accommodate them. So we'll make our best effort to do so. If you've asked and and allowed folks the ability to disclose uh, accessibility, and and it's a good practice to put in there, you need X amount of time to do that. So you might have a registration form that says. Um, you know, what do you need to participate fully in this event and, um, you know, accessibility or accommodations and someone might say, um, uh, yeah, I need a sign language interpreter. It's, it's within your right to put in there that you need, you know, seven business days or ten business days or, or, or whatever you think it is to, to set that particular request up and, and meet that request. So if it's within that window, my best practice usually is to try to still honor the request, but I can't guarantee it to the patron. And so, um, again, the ADA is going to give you points for good faith effort and and making uh, um, the best attempt to accommodate. Um, but they're not you're not going to get sued if you've asked ahead of time and someone just shows up and 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 demands and says you have to do it. Um, you know, the other piece of this is 
is a lot of the things allowing the participants as much control over um, how they're going to navigate things as possible. Um, we did a frequently asked questions here when we did our event um, where we foreshadowed some of some of the requests and things. And, and most of the requests weren't for an actual item or service. They were just like, how do I do this or how do I do that? And so we posted those frequently asked questions. We weren't required to do so, but it was really helpful to sort of limit that last minute request. Because the last minute requests are usually people who just are new and they just don't know how to navigate the system. Janet, do you have to put on that? I would just add to that too, it's, you know, those last minute requests, that's really where your CVB that you've been working with can really help you. You know, we, we can't promise to, to perform miracles, but when you are dealing with those last minute requests, especially something that's going to require a local resource, um, talk to your CVB when you get those. And, and, and I, I can speak for all of us that we would do whatever we could to help you. Janet, can and, I tell you know, a real quick story on this? So, so one of the things that we did here um, is, we set aside some things um, when we were, if you, there's any ticket people out there who are doing ticketing or seats or things like that, we set aside a couple of these things to accommodate those last minute requests because we knew they were coming in. So that's another point. Part of, part of your post uh, event information helps you uh, kind of prepare for the next year on that, I bet. Yes. Well, um, you know, related. Um, we had a question that came in regarded to, all right, so say we need to accommodate a special need, whether that be an interpreter or um, a wheelchair um, during the trade show. Whose financial responsibility is it to, um, to accommodate that? Um, in the UK, that certainly would be the planners. Is that the same case here? Yeah, it is the responsibility of the host event or the organizing body, um, basically the, the folks who are taking the money um, to provide the accommodation. Okay, thank you. Um, another, you know, international sort of question um, uh, is that uh, this planner uh, plans meetings international. Um, so, you know, do we, are, are the are the um, disability acts differently, the laws um, internationally? Are they similar to um, what we might expect here when planning a meeting internationally? That is a fantastic question. They're not, actually. Um, every country has its own set of rules and laws and how they govern and enforce those laws. And uh, um, we're fortunate in this country to be a relatively young country, so we don't have quite the old buildings and structures that you have to navigate like they, they might in, in Europe, for example. And we also are pretty well off, and so we have the ability to um, do infrastructure um, unlike some other places. So, you know, it's, it's a, that's a sticky wicket that you'd want to, again, ask the questions ahead of time. Um, international travel for people with disabilities is not unheard of. Um, there's a lot of systems and resources in the place you're going, and I would reach out to them and then make sure you're sharing that with the international traveler. And um, if you have a disability and, and you, you travel or you're thinking of travel, um, again, all that information on the front end is really, really valuable. And I think there is a, an understanding that it is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It, it doesn't translate overseas. And so, it, you know, it's prudent for a person with a disability to start understanding what they're getting into and how they're going to navigate that system. Um, what about service animals? Um, this planner is asking, Linda is asking, you know, um, someone has, is, is there any um, documentation to determine whether someone has a service animal or just a pet? Um, so what uh. kind of documentation are, is it prudent to um, ask for? So I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a lawyer, so definitely this is a great <laughs> ADA technical assistance question. Every state has a technical assistance uh, hotline or, or business assistant hotline um, that you can ask these specific questions. I don't want to defer the question. This is, this is one of the most popular questions I hear all the time. And my understanding, because the rule just changed in 2010, was or is that um, there, you, service animals do not require a 
documentation or a jacket or a note from the doctor. It is not required to be a service animal. Um, but they did change it to service animals are now only dogs and, believe it or not, miniature horses. Their lobby must be fantastic. I'm not sure exactly how that happened, oh, but no. miniature horses and dogs. Um, so the service snake or the service parrot or the, the service monkey, and I've, I've seen them all, um, does not really qualify under the ADA as a service animal. There is a distinction between therapy animals, comfort animals, um, and the ADA uh, disability technical assistance folks are trying to wrestle with that, and they actually just released a white paper on this on uh, the Department of Justice website, I believe, um, that tries to further clarify. There's really only one or two questions you can ask someone, and it comes down to the task that that animal performs um, that helps that person with their disability. You can't ask them their disability, what their disability is, but you can ask what ta task that animal is trained to perform that helps them with their disability. My best practice is, you know, to um, uh, um, to ask the question, um, to make sure that we're actually asking the question fairly of everybody, but also to, um, um, you know, um, best customer service usually prevails. So if it if it's not disruptive to everybody else, I'm usually playing that safe side. But again, check with your your local Dib Tech or Disability Business Technical Assistance Center. Good advice. Um, another question um, has to do with whether or not um, the accommodation that the host provided or the show producer provided is not reasonable. They had offered um, an accommodation for a person with a disability and then they did not want it. Um, can we make them responsible for the cost of something they had requested and now don't want? So are you, are you saying that someone re requested it, you signed them up, you hired that person, and then they declined? It could be that, and it also is, um, um, I think it's a two-part question. So first of all, they, they were making an accommodation for a disability, and mm -hmm. um, is, is what determines if, it, if this accommodation is not reasonable? I think there is a okay. whole question around reasonable um, right. assistance, right? So and the second again, part of that um, addresses if they requested the, the accommodation and then they didn't want it, and then who bears the cost of that? Right. Um, the first part of the question I can answer, answer more easily, and um, basically the ADA is set up so that um, Reasonable accommodation is the key phrase, and it's a very subjective one. And so there's a couple litmus tests. Um, one would be that it provides an undue financial or administrative burden. Um, so, but that is subject to the budget of the entire organization. And um, it, it's hard to say. It depends on who's underwriting the, the event, what a financial burden is. So. You know, I, I can't really tell you what I can't give you a dollar number to do that. The other is if it uh, request poses a direct threat to staff or volunteers or the patron, um, and the third is that it fundamentally uh, changes the nature of the, the program or service. So, um, for example, uh, you're busing everybody someplace, and and um, they want a plane or a helicopter. That's probably undue financial burden and also um, fundamentally different than what you're, the experience you're providing all the rest of the patrons. Um, that says, uh, that said, you know, you're looking at looking at requests of that nature on a case by case basis, and so um, making sure that you're able to to um, provide a, a reasonable accommodation. Uh, means it depends on, on the disability, unfortunately. So there isn't a, a, a magic checklist that you can do for that. Um, I don't sometimes check with my disability business technical assistance folks or, or ADA info folks to see what's reasonable and not. Um, the other piece is going to best practices. But most conference goers uh, will make requests depending on um, their need to really attend the conference. It might be unreasonable to say, 
um, you know, I want an interpreter because I'm going to go sightseeing around town. So that's, you're looking at sort of parallel experience to other attendees uh, for, the, for the part that, that you're responsible for. So, you know, the conference uh, sessions, um, off-site sessions, uh, exhibitions, things like that. Um, the second piece is if uh, who bears the cost. Um, that's a really tricky one because it depends on on what it is and when the cost comes in. And so, most of the time, the the conference operations um, ends up bearing some or most of the cost for an accommodation. Um, it's really hard to uh, have a patron pay for the accommodation. Um, because it's not really their responsibility for attending an event. If there you have a cancellation policy, gosh, I'm not really even familiar with how that would apply. So chances are it's it's going to fall on the organizer and not the patron. We tend not to charge individuals for for their accommodations. Okay, and so. One last question here, um, which might be a little bit more technical, and perhaps in the resources we'll be sending our uh, webinar attendees today. But um, Linda had a question regarding um, we, they have many wheelchairs um, and similar mobility devices at their conference. And she was curious if there's some guidelines about how far apart in terms of feet or inches is good for her aisles through the plenary room. Or her oh my gosh, that's a great question. I, I, I would almost say that question was seated. So they just did some uh, they just did some rule res, uh, um, re revisions in 2010, and so there's two things to address here. One is um, what those mobility devices are, what qualifies, and they just did a beautiful rule revision about mobility devices and other powered mobility devices. What's in, what's out. With the invention of the Segway, we're all wondering a mobility device or not. And so there's some great rule clarifications online about that. Um, yeah, aisle width um, seat, seating also was one of these things that was addressed in the last 2010. Um, so there's great specifications there. I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, but all of those things are new, including um, uh, uh, companion seating. And so you think of, you know, you have a person with a disability, are they coming with a friend or a spouse or an attendant or somebody else? Um, where do they sit? How do you accommodate that person? And all of those uh, rules were revised in 2010, and there's great regs and specs up online. Oh, perfect. Well, I think that's all the time we have, Terry, and I think the audience uh, seem to be very interested in these questions. Uh, based upon the fact we've got everybody staying. So thank you very, very much. I, clearly the audience um, was as impressed um, with both um, Andy and Janice as I have been. And I just want to thank you both again for extending your time and your generosity in being part of an education process for planners, um, both about accessibility concerns and then also about how CVBs can really provide great resources in the destinations that you're visiting. And Andy and uh, Janice, your enthusiasm certainly poured out, your knowledge poured out, and thank you for supporting us. And it was really our pleasure to have you today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. And actually, I, I do have to say that we can't do anything in this community without Janice's help. So it's really important to have you all involved um, on my end as a as a community member as, and as one of the people that works with the organization. So yeah, this, this is, I, I'd love to say that I was just doing this because I was selfless, but um, I, I need you guys. So I appreciate you all uh, attending. Great. And I would, I would echo thank you, Terry and DMAI. We really appreciate being part of this. And, and, and I hope if the one thing we've communicated about um, CVBs in general to, to uh, everyone listening is that you know, it's, we're such a great resource for any local questions and local issues. And much as Andy said about training volunteers, we may not have the answers, but we can get you to the people that have the answers, as Andy is very evident <laughs> of that. <laughs> Perfect. And thank you both, and have a great day. Shimo, it was a, a wonderful webinar, and we will look forward to providing the webinar recording. And again, that will be getting out to everyone, along with their CMP credit for joining us today. And you should expect that in your email next business week. <laughs>